today's presentation will be given by Susan Shirk, the chair of the 21st Century China Center and research professor at the School of, Public of Global Policy and Strategy at the University of California, San Diego. She first visited China in 1971 and has been teaching, researching, and engaging China diplomatically ever since. From 1997 to 2000, she served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of East Asia and Pacific Affairs with the responsibility for China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Mongolia. She has many, many books that I will not read here, and today she is speaking to us Overreach and Overreaction, the Crisis in U.S.-China Relations. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, it's a, a great pleasure and honor to be here at the Lieberthal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies, and I want to thank uh, Professor Gallagher and her colleagues for inviting me. I'm of the same generation of China hands as Ken Lieberthal. And, um, you know, people like us who've spent our entire lives and careers uh, studying China, trying to understand it better, trying to, and of course, Ken Lieberthal and I were in the Clinton administration at the same time as well, working in government. It was very rare opportunities for academics to participate in uh, this effort to try to create a foundation for a healthy uh, and constructive relationship between the U.S. and China. Nowadays, people look back on that period as somehow something of a golden age in U.S.-China relations, which I'm sure Ken and I would be happy to claim credit for, but uh, of course it was a lot more complicated than our contributions. But now, uh, people like us are intensely worried about the state of U.S.-China relations, um, the growing antagonism between these two very important countries. Uh, so you may wonder about the title of my talk. And I do believe that the United States and China are at the precipice, if not already, in something similar to a Cold War, although it's very, very different from the U.S.-Soviet Cold War, obviously, because, especially because of how closely intertwined our two economies and societies have become. So it's very, very different. But it has a lot of the same um, intense, uh, mutual suspicion and hostility that we had during the Cold War, as well as this ideological dimension and the uh, kind of clash of systems. So, uh, and this is unprecedented in the 40 years of diplomatic relations between the two countries. We've had crises before, but they have been uh, triggered <coughs> by particular events. This one is deeper and more systemic. And it's at a time when the capabilities of the, of the two countries are more evenly matched than anything that has happened before. So, you know, the dangers of conflict are greater and uh, the difficulty in finding a peaceful equilibrium are greater. So what does it mean to overreach? Uh, the, the definition of overreach is to defeat oneself by seeking to do or gain too much and going to excess in a way that is costly to oneself. A critical feature of this notion of overreach is you go too far in something and it snaps back to harm you. Um, of course, a judgment about what is overreaching is subjective, but this crucial element is that you're harming your own country's national interests. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's pretty clear that right now there is an international backlash against China that is costly to China. 
that I believe is being triggered by China's overreach. Now, I should add that the United States itself has done some overreaching uh, and costly overreaching after the end of the Cold War with its interventions in Iraq, um, other political interventions which have certainly been costly to America's international interests. Okay, that's the overreach side. Overreaction defined as a more emotional or forcible response than is justified. The uh, definition of overreaction doesn't have the self-defeating element in it, but I think that is actually implicit. And I do believe that uh, the United States is overreacting to the perceived threat from China, and in the process, it's harming itself. In particular, it's the openness and vibrancy of our own economy and society, which are the ultimate sources of American strength and competitiveness. So overreach and overreaction. Uh, China's overreaching has heightened fears of a China threat and sparked a defensive backlash that goes far beyond <coughs> the Trump administration. Uh, Democrats and Republicans, basically the only thing in Congress, basically the only thing they can agree upon is anti-China bills, uh, where you see a very strong political consensus. But what's important to point out, and I make this point in China all the time, that this backlash is not limited to the United States. You also see it in Europe and pretty much uh, all of the advanced industrial countries, Australia, uh, Japan. And um, so this, and you, you, we see all sorts of restrictions on Chinese outbound tech investment being put in place by these countries. Um, some restrictions on Chinese visiting scholars and students. It's not just in the United States. The United States might be a more extreme version of it, but it's happening in other advanced industrial countries as well. So, and these restrictions are costly to China's ambitions to become a high-tech power, uh, but they're also costly to the United States and other countries that put these restrictions in place. So, um, and I think one way of looking at this is that both China and America, which are so interdependent already, are weaponizing their interdependence. They're so fearful of one another that they're exploiting their economic and technological leverage to punish and pressure the other side. And then simultaneously, they're trying to reduce their mutual vulnerability uh, by um, becoming more self-reliance. So what's fascinating intellectually, but also very alarming in terms of the welfare of the human race is that science and technology have become the focal point of this um, competition between the two, uh, the two countries that fuses and confuses national security, economic competitiveness, and political status in the world. I think it's pretty obvious that the consequences of actual decoupling would be tragic. The Chinese and American economies together constitute 40% of the global economy. Um, and it's important to point out that more countries have China as their largest trading partner than the United States does. So if the United States takes this decoupling approach, 
because of its fears of China's technological advance and capabilities, including ones that uh, make it a more militarily more capable country, then uh, it's by no means obvious that the United States will win this competition because there are many countries who are being caught in between and they are going to be very reluctant to cut off their relationships uh, with China. So, and of course, decoupling is already uh, causing a big hit in global economic growth, and I think this is only going to get worse. Um, and then, of course, the opportunity costs of our more integrated approach are huge. All of the discoveries and the, uh, that we have been able to make working together, scientists in American universities, other labs, uh, people from China and the United States working together to do great things, you know, that is going to slow down progress if both countries pursue uh, a more self-reliant approach. So how did we get here to this situation of overreach and overreaction, which could, which will, you know, um, could have these disastrous consequences for all of us? Uh, now, the Chinese Communist Party's official explanation to its own people about why the West has turned against China is very simple and defensive. It's the inevitable consequence of the shifting balance of power. As China rises in its economic, technological, military power, America seeks to cling to its dominant position by containing China's growing strength. And this is a kind of mechanistic view which has, is very similar to the position of realist scholars like John Mearsheimer or Graham Allison. Uh, you know, the logic of the rise and fall of nations always causes the reigning power to misperceive the threat of the rising power and to try to slow down its rise. So what Chinese official media tells its people, this was bound to happen sooner or later, just happening now, you know, we have no responsibility for the situation. Now, there's some truth to the theory, uh, obviously. Uh, realist theory wouldn't have been around as long as it has if there wasn't some truth to the theory. Misperceptions are endemic in international relations, and as we see China coming up on our tail very fast, uh, that causes us to exaggerate China's capabilities and also have a sense of great um, uh, uh, underestimate our own capabilities. And we also misperceive China as a monolith. This is haven't, how many times have you heard people say, what does China want? As if there is an answer to that question. You know, China is a, ha, there are a lot of moving parts in China. A lot of different interest groups, bureaucratic interest groups, even within the leadership. My guess is that there are differences. Although I admit that it's increasingly difficult to perceive them. And so uh, we don't recognize the diversity of Chinese society or the differences between the party's interests and the interests of society. Although it is interesting that Secretary of State Pompeo in a recent speech highlighted the differences between what's in the party's interests and what's in the interests of China Chinese society, and of course, people in China, uh, the leadership in China was very upset about that, but I think it's a fair point. Uh, 
that. And so that's one reason uh, we at the 21st Century China Center at UC San Diego, we've started a project um, called China from the Ground Up to try to get a sense of the diversity uh, of Chinese society and contribute those insights to our policymakers, which we think is an important thing to do. So um, this argument that the Chinese government makes that it's simply power transition, China's grown more powerful, so of course the U.S. is now trying to contain it, is really, I, I don't agree with that. Um, I don't think that's correct. And I've said this in China. Um, and in my view, the United States and China, uh, the Chinese leadership has made some very specific choices, policy choices, which have provoked this backlash. They've overreached in their foreign policy as well as their domestic policy. And I will very briefly make the argument to you that this overreaching didn't just start with Xi Jinping. So another kind of oversimplification on the US side is let's blame it all on Xi Jinping, which I admit I myself from time to time am prone to do, but it's really not accurate. Um, it really began uh, in the mid-2000s, kind of between the first and second terms of the Hu Jintao, Wen Jiabao administration. So the fact of the matter is that China's policies and its own actions changed around that time. And uh, trying to figure out why is a very interesting intellectual puzzle that I've been engaged in for a book I'm writing. So let's just quickly describe how things were working before, say, 2008-9. Before that time, the United States and China were getting along quite well despite the differences in their political systems. I mean, these differences now we say, oh, you know, they're a communist state and we're a market democracy, so it's kind of hopeless, we'll never manage to get along. But in fact, we were getting along quite well and the Communist Party was ruling China and we had a, a democratic system. And China was growing very fast at that time. Um, on the China side, the key was a restrained foreign policy to a kind of reassurance policy, restraint and reassurance. And Deng Xiaoping set the orientation uh, and it was followed by Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao. And the reason they were pursuing this restrained and reassurance policy, you might say it's because they didn't, they still were weak, but um, that assumes that there's some essentialist China that's always had some big ambition. I don't buy it that way. I see this is all a work in progress and uh, could go different ways. Um, and restraint and reassurance were motivated by a pretty sophisticated understanding that as China grew rapidly in its capabilities, it was going to trigger threat perceptions and look like a threat in the eyes of its neighbors, the United States, and other countries. So what they wanted to do is reassure us outside of China that their intentions were benign and friendly even as their capabilities improved. And they did this not just by saying, oh, we're not a threat. They did it through actions. 
by settling land border disputes through diplomacy that involved compromise, giving back as much as they gained or even more than they gained. Uh, working on a code of conduct in the South China Sea, kind of a management of the disputes, maritime disputes in the South China Sea, participating in global and regional multinational, multilateral institutions, joining nonproliferation regimes, joining WTO. All of these were ways of signaling a reassurance about intentions. And this restrained approach reaped great rewards for China, obviously. China really was able to develop its uh, economy, improve living standards, gain a lot of international status and respect. And on the U.S. side, the U.S. was pursuing a policy of engagement plus maintaining a position of strength in the Asia Pacific. Um, and, you know, the United States, uh, you know, I sometimes say that the United States actually sponsored China's emergence as a global power because we created the G20 to get China at the table. <coughs> um, Bob Zelik talked about encouraging China to be a constructive, what do we call it? constructive strategic stakeholder. And, you know, so we welcome China to a seat at the table, even in a leadership, shared leadership position. So really, um, it was a pretty generous approach, is what I would say not hoarding American power and being reluctant to share it with a rising power like China. To the contrary, we felt that this could work out, actually, and it was working out, you know, quite well. The key, of course, was, or not the key, but one important element was that China was pursuing economic reform and even modest political reforms. And, um, and so China was, its economic policies were converging with global market economy norms. And international business was the key constituency in the United States and other advanced industrial countries for engagement with China. So international business was happy, they were making money operating in China, and uh, they were a critical uh, constituency for engagement with China. So um, this, uh, you know, I can't, overestimate the importance of the view of the business community because the overreactions we see today I believe are driven in large part by the fact that the business community is has become so estranged and resentful and unhappy with Chinese policies post 2008 and that they are no longer standing up for engagement with China. And instead, what we see in the United States is the security, national security hawks, as a shorthand, are dominating the policy process. Usually in the past, based on my own experience in government and what I've observed, is on the national security side, the Pentagon, the intelligence communities, uh, the defense industries, they always want to restrict technology transfer to China. They want tighter controls. The business community wants to do business. They have commercial interests. 
they push back, the White House strikes a balance somewhere in between. But now that balance has been lost. And it's been lost uh, because Chinese policies beginning actually in 2006 became much more dominated by state actors. And the uh, China's efforts to develop its advanced technologies and its economy became driven more by the political goals of the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese party state. Um, you know, what we could call a mercantilist approach um, than they had previously. So what this may, means is non-tariff barriers for international firms. It means um, uh, pressures to transfer technology uh, in joint ventures in China. Uh, it means pursuing, even pursuing completely illegitimate methods like intellectual property theft. So, however, it's not all intellectual property theft. I mean, one of the overreactions in, that you hear and read every day in the United States is that China's become a high-tech superpower and it's all based on intellectual property theft. But in fact, of course, its own indigenous innovation has been, uh, you know, the most important source. And then it has acquired technologies from abroad in ways that are both legitimate and illegitimate. So, but the point I want to make is the business, the loss of um, positive, warm, fuzzy feelings by the international corporations toward China is, I think, a critical factor in the domestic politics of our own overreaction today. So um, China's overreaching, you know, the turning point is in the mid-2000s, the high-tech industrial policy, the mercantilist approach really, really begins even before the global financial crisis in 2006. Um, the, uh, but the foreign policy begins around 2008, 2009, and the most important sign of a kind of more assertive or more aggressive China losing its restraint, abandoning restraint, which had characterized its policies previously, was in these maritime disputes in the South China Sea, which is so important because it really changed the narrative, the international narrative about Chinese intentions. It, you know, and uh, China has claimed, had these expansive sovereignty claims for quite some time, but they also valued good relations with their neighbors in Southeast Asia. So previously, they had put good relations with their neighbors ahead of these sovereignty claims. Now, in the beginning when this started, I thought this must be driven by nationalist sentiment inside China that's pushing the government. Because in my book, China Fragile Superpower, I talked a lot about uh, nationalism inside China, especially vis-a-vis -vis Japan, and how this really put a lot of pressure on the foreign ministry and other policymakers in China to 
do a lot of um, taking tough stands against the Japanese government. Um, but I was puzzled because, in fact, the South China Sea had gotten very little attention in China's popular media, internet, before 2008, 2009. It was not a big deal. If you, I'm sure those of you who went to school in China, maybe during that period, compared to the way people focus on Japan, it really wasn't considered a hot button of um, domestic nationalism. So that wasn't the explanation. So what I, and so I've been trying to figure out why this happened. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with bureaucratic politics, interest group politics inside China, which is a story I won't get into because it'll take too long. But, and then it also has to do with the global financial crisis, which uh, led to a kind of premature triumphalism in China and a sense that the US was on the decline and so a certain demand for a little more assertive foreign policy. But regardless, the important thing is that Chinese policy started putting pursuit of these sovereignty claims ahead of good relations with neighbors. So then what kind of rising power is this? Is this really a rising power that is a threat, it increased threat perceptions from China's neighbors, from the United States and other countries. And it's overreaching because it is backfiring uh, it, against China's own national interests in a lot of ways, uh, including, um, you know, causing Southeast Asian countries to kind of hedge more away from China. But of course, uh, the United States is also doing a lot of uh, counterproductive foreign policy at the time. So I don't think we're um, responding to this situation in a very sensible way either. So, um, and then the third thing, so state-led economic policy, mercantilism, uh, putting sovereignty claims ahead of its own national interests and good relations with its neighbors. You know, China is surrounded by 20 neighbors. If China, through diplomacy, can have positive relations with its neighbors, that is such a huge security benefit to China. The third thing is um, uh, the domestic political trends. And actually, I see the crackdown on the media and on civil society starts before the Olympics. And then it just never loosened up again. When it happened, we thought, oh, this is just pre-Olympics. Want to make sure, no surprises. And then after the Olympics, which was such a high point of <coughs> national pride for China, the very, I mean, this is where you'd like to see nationalism go. Olympics, moonshots, all of these positive contributions which China is making. But after the Olympics, things never loosened up again. So, uh, and this stability maintenance, way when, just lost restraint. So the repression in China intensified, really, beginning right before the Olympics. And then, of course, now, Moving into the Xi Jinping era, all of the three dimensions, the statist economic policy no longer converging with global norms, the 
assertiveness on the sovereignty disputes and the domestic political trends. She, she, under Xi Jinping, all of those things have only intensified. In other words, Xi Jinping could have established, he could have been a Deng Xiaoping type figure who restrained all of these moving parts in China to pursue a restrained foreign policy, a more market-oriented economic reform policy, and gradual improvements in governance in China, uh, less political control over society, and banked on delivering the economic goods and being a communist party that stands for development and economic betterment to maintain popular support. He didn't do that. He chose to kind of double down on this unrestrained overreaching, both domestically and internationally. And of course, um, the by creating also a more concentrated, personalistic leadership system instead of the collective leadership that we had under Hu Jintao, which of course was very ineffective in many ways, and there was a lot of complaints about it. Corrupt, um, inertia, not progress on reform, a lot of problems with it admittedly, but the collective leadership, one of the great achievements of the post-Dung leadership, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, is they devised a mechanism for peaceful turnover of power at the top, which no communist country had ever done before. And what Xi Jinping has done is thrown it out the window which I think shocked people outside of China and shocked people inside China, and sent a signal that, okay, now we're dealing with, you know, a very autocratic dictatorial leader, and we, it's going to be much more difficult to stabilize relations with this kind of leader. Now, of course, in our own country and in many other countries, we see similar trends. So nothing I'm saying about China is, should be viewed as a defense of anything in American policy today. So let's turn to, and there are a number of other things that have happened under Xi Jinping that, um, including the way they treat overseas Chinese today, Chinese living in other countries, which I consider a form of overreaching, trying to, uh, with an expectation that ethnic Chinese living in Australia, living in Europe, living in the United States, would have some loyalty to the government in Beijing, which is very different from the restraint in the overseas Chinese policies before. The overseas Chinese department was put under the party, United Front Department, and um, this has led to a lot of pressures and problems on ethnic Chinese in different countries. So um, let's talk about the overreaction. I have time. Um, <coughs> there are three types of overreactions that I'm really most worried about in terms of the harm it's doing to America's own interests and values. 
And I gave you my explanation for why it's happening. One is, uh, you know, I identified the particular Chinese policies that are provoking this overreaction, especially this loss of support from the business community and the rise of the security hawks. So um, in the last couple of years, the threat of China surpassing the United States in critical technologies is now viewed as a serious national security threat. So the CFIUS body that reviews foreign investments in the United States, export control rules, which we still don't have the regulations, are about to be handed down soon, but it looks like they are defining critical and emerging technologies too expansively to cover almost anything including biotech, autonomous vehicles, battery storage, not just submarine sonar or missile technology, but all these advanced technologies, AI, robotics, all of this. So um, in the process of restricting uh, collaborations, between scientists and between companies and universities and scientists and engineers working in these areas, I think that we will end up damaging our own innovation ecosystem. Um, and we'll find our, you know, we all compete, firms and countries and universities, we all compete for talented people. The talent contest is really, talent is the most important input into innovation. And um, what's happening in America now is that we are um, discouraging, excluding explicitly through visa restrictions and through the instructions that federal agencies are giving to universities um, and, um, and uh, export control policies, which by the way govern who can be in the labs when uh, uh, universities are working on certain technologies. If we define this critical technology domain too broadly, not limiting it to the most directly impacting defense um, capabilities, that we're going to hound out of the United States, we're going to drive out of the United States or exclude from the United States all these very talented Chinese people. And uh, of course, this is would, won't be the first time this has happened. This happened during the first Cold War. Uh, of course, the best known example is Chen Shui's son, the father of, uh, who had been at Caltech and then was the McCarthyite investigations were, uh, drove him out of the United States back to China where he became the father of China's very successful missile program. So, um, so former Secretary of Defense Robert Gates often talks about the way to think about restrictions on tech transfer to China as small yard high fence. Okay, so small, the key is defining the size of the yard. So, you know, I think that we would be better off um, strengthening ourselves, competing by investing more in research, competing for talent, and preserving our own open universities, open economy, and open society. You know, so many Chinese scientists and engineers would love to
put their startup in the United States, and they have done it. And if we persist in this, what um, former Treasury Secretary Paulson has called this technological iron curtain that's descending, that we are, that let's, let's put it this way, the United States is definitely the main driver in this technological iron curtain. China itself put restrictions on what American and Western technology firms could do. Remember, they drove um, Google out. They had a thing about it had to be secure and controllable technology. So their fixation on security Actually, you could say, if we're finger pointing who started it, they started it with that, which alienated Western companies. But then, what, what's happening now, in particular the entity list, in which we essentially embargoed American technology from going into Huawei, ZTE, and other Chinese firms, which is so costly to our own companies, and sent such a strong signal of unremitting hostility toward China. If we're willing to endure such costs ourselves to do this, we've already defined China as an enemy. And it's been perceived that way in China. Before we put uh, Qualcomm and other Intel and other American technologies, uh, put Huawei and other companies on the energy list and said they could no longer buy and integrate American technologies in their equipment, there were many people in China who actually welcomed the pressure from the Trump administration and others because they wanted more market reforms in China. And they felt maybe this outside, because there are no checks and balances on Xi Jinping's power internally. This is the way they think about it. So maybe the foreign pressure will help. They sort of welcomed it, but after we acted with this uh, entity list. That just seemed so hostile, so obvious uh, a containment move, and a, so much an effort to get at China, slow down China, that now you see much more unified support of uh, a self-reliant policy on China's part and much more suspicion and resentment of the United States. So it's counterproductive, in my view, in every respect. How much more security have we bought for ourselves? You know, um, and then, of course, um, I also worry about the, um, well, maybe I'll just leave it there. Um, and I believe that we ought to double down on the American approach. We should compete with China, but we should compete with China in a smart way. Which I and I believe it'll be much smarter and more successful if we become a better version of ourselves, of the American open economy, open universities, open societies, than if we basically become more like China. And you see what's happening today. The news is saying today China is going to announce its own version of the entity list. It'll retaliate against our companies. 
And this is the decoupling that is happening as we speak. So um, I believe that this interaction of overreach and overreaction is, um, is leading all of us off a cliff and it's going to be very harmful. Uh, I hope maybe that in our, uh, I mean of course political campaigns are never a good place to actually have rational discussion of foreign policy. <laughs> But, you know, these are some of the issues that really people who are running for president should think about and address. I think I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. We have a short period of time, maybe 10 minutes, for a Q&A with Dr. Shirk. Um, and there are two mics in the room on both sides of the room if you have a question. I have a question over here. Thank you very much for this very uh, thought-provoking lecture. Uh, you know, it's been said that the first thing that uh, friends do is they begin to share virtues and, and enemies exchange vices. Who said that? I wish I could remember. Okay, I wanna, <laughs> I wanna use it. <laughs> I want to steal it. <laughs> but in, in one area in particular, and this was in the news just today, I believe, in part, uh, China turns out about 10 times as many graduate engineers every year as the US. And I assume that it's similar for other important uh, areas of study as well. And today in the news, it w there was a statement that uh, there's an international assessment of student achievement worldwide the US, the U.S. is pretty low. It's stagnant since about 2000. And in China, the, the four top areas, on average, were, were all from China. Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen. And so doesn't this portend a potential, uh, a, probably a, the China will greatly surpass the U.S. in the development of future technologies? Talent. Talent. Yeah. Talent. Well, well, that's why we have to improve our own educational system, point one. You know, that's a national security issue. Let's turn that into a national security issue. And secondly, that's why we have to have immigration. That's, you know, that's why America has prospered the way it has. Other countries have shortages of skilled manpower. We have a shortage of homegrown skilled manpower. That's why we, but everybody wants to come study here and set up their businesses here. We have the best legal system. We, you know, um, you know, our air is relatively better, you know, not perfect, but really, you know, so there are so many reasons. We have freedom to say and do what you want. I mean, so it seems to me pretty obvious what we need to do. We just need to strengthen our own education and maintain an open immigration policy. Yeah. How you doing, ma'am? Thank you so much for being here today and mm -hmm. uh, for this talk. Um, w as you're talking, I was thinking as far when you're mentioning the overreaction side of things, um, in recent days, uh, the president signed a declaration essentially supporting the, the Hong Kong protesters. Do you think that was an overreaction, or do you think that was detrimental to uh, relations? And, and if, if not, I guess, what would you recommend? Oh, I, I think that was the right thing to do. I'm not a big fan of the actual legislation itself because it's going to punish Hong Kong more than Beijing. So I don't quite get that. Um, you know, because if we treat Hong Kong uh, products and services the way we treat those from the China mainland, then that's going to uh, 
um, cause a lot of companies to leave Hong Kong. It'll harm the Hong Kong economy, harm the Hong Kong uh, livelihood of the people. So I wish there'd been a way of condemning the situation in Hong Kong without punishing the people of Hong Kong, which I believe this legislation will do. But on the other hand, you know, I think the United States had to do something. And you can see the way Beijing has reacted so far with, frankly, pretty minimal retaliation. So, I mean, it's pretty clear that the Chinese government, Xi Jinping, they, they want to stabilize relations with the United States now. And they want this trade deal to happen. They want the tariffs to go away. And they're not going to. So, so in a way, it's a sign of restraint that they haven't done anything more dire. Um, so let's give credit where credit is due. This is a pretty restrained reaction. You mentioned uh, a moment ago, you were talking about the complementary nature of improving the education here and also immigration is two complementary things. I would just like to suggest that besides being complementary, it tends to, well, that hasn't worked against each other in the sense that the United States, rather, rather than relying on improving the, research, improving the base of the population here, that for a long, long time, we've relied on the fact that we'll have the best and the brightest of the immigrants come, and therefore we don't really have to do that much for the, for the mass. At the top, the educational system here attracts, but in terms of elementary education, high school education. I, I don't really think that's the explanation. I think uh, elementary and secondary education are local and state government responsibilities. We don't have a centralized federal educational system. And, and plus the fact, I don't think we've quite figured out how to do it better. There is a, so I don't, I don't agree that there's some grand bargain here or something. I, I, I don't see that. I don't mean it was unconsciously, that's the way it's worked out. Well, it's fortunate that we have some way. Questions on this side? Hello, thank you so much for your talk. I'm so inspired by talks without slides. This is wonderful. Um, oh, yeah. I, on, it's, it's, it's actually honestly true. And um, I guess my question is kind of for the elephants that are all in this room gathered listening, which is what, what of the role for China hands, both from China and also not from China? What, um, what interventions do you see as positive and what might be some of the challenges associated with being a China hand? in this day and age? Hmm. Well, you know, one thing that I and my colleagues often highlight for people in China, including policymakers, is you, you lost the business community, you also kind of lost the academic community. So China hands have turned much more critical because they actually study what's going on in China. And they um, are quite critical of the trends. <coughs> they have so many Chinese friends, they love China, but they think that the policies are not necessarily good for people in China. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's important for people to do research on the complexities of China and improve our understanding of how China actually works. There's so much we don't understand. And of course, there's so much secrecy, especially in the central level apparatus and decision making that's very difficult to penetrate. But illuminating all the moving parts in China, I think is a great contribution to trying to stabilize US-China relations. I think that um, 
it's important for people to do the best they can not to self-censor themselves in order to ingratiate themselves with the Chinese government. It's, it's really hard because it used to be that nobody really cared that much what we wrote about or what we said and increasingly the propaganda apparatus, the internal security people are paying too much attention to what people outside of China say about China. They want to make sure everybody says only good things. And there are a whole bunch of what are essentially domestic political issues inside China like, well, of course, Taiwan, but Taiwan, Tibet, Xinjiang, Hong Kong, South China Sea, you know, it, it seems that these kind of core interests keep expanding. And, you know, uh, Huawei, look what they did to FedEx over Huawei. Um, so it is difficult because th they are increasingly using visa policies to, uh, to try to pressure people to take the right stance on these domestic political issues. And so if you speak too critically, even you go to, even if it isn't in your writing, but you give a speech somewhere or something like that, there is a chance you could end up not be getting a visa to come into China. And then just doing research in China is more difficult. And of course, uh, Chinese academics are bearing the brunt of this, not us. So it's a much more challenging environment, but seems to be, given the importance of US-China relations, it means our work is all the more important. So I hope people will keep at it. I have one more question over here. Hi. Um, so uh, it's a domestic issue. The, the Uyghurs, uh, over a million, have been reportedly put in these real rehabilitation camps. Mm -hmm. What about the role of economic sanctions when it comes to human <sighs> rights? Yeah, we, I think we actually, for the first time, put sanctions on in relation to a domestic human rights I mean, of course we have, after Tiananmen, we had sanctions, 1989. But I think the sanctions we put on uh, officials working in Xin, re responsible for the repression in Xinjiang. Also, we have the entity list. We put companies that do facial recognition and other control uh, technologies and we are telling our companies they can't participate or share technology with them. Um, I don't think it's going to achieve the goal. My, uh, I've been frustrated since before I went into government as a person who cares deeply about freedom of expression and civil rights for people in China. And I have spent my whole life, you know, I care about people in China. I want them to have the best possible conditions to live in. Um, they deserve it. But I have yet to see any approach by you, the United States government or outside pressure that has actually achieved improvement on the ground. So I despair of that. I really, I just don't see, I don't think it's going to make any difference. Look at what happened with the United Nations battle of the letters about Xinjiang uh, internment camps, indoctrination camps. China got 55 
countries to sign a letter praising its policies in Xinjiang, including Muslim countries. The United States and its European allies got 23 countries criticizing it. So um, I don't think outside pressure is going to address this, but I mean, we need to speak out. We need to criticize and we need to shame. It's important to shame what's going on, but I really don't think that the pressure is going to be effective. Hi, um, I was wondering if these current U.S.-China trends were to continue, what would U.S.-China relations look like 20 to 30 years down the line? What kind of ramifications will there be? If the present direction <coughs> continues, oh, we'll, I mean, we'll be in a full-fledged Cold War. We'll be very focused on how to put guardrails around the Cold War to prevent it becoming a hot war. You know, that'll mean we'll, we'll have to focus on crisis management, <coughs> maybe some arms control agreements. You know, then some lessons from the U.S.-Soviet Cold War could be quite relevant because it lasted, U.S.-Soviet Cold War lasted for a long time and we somehow managed not to blow one another up. So I think even though the two Cold Wars, Cold War I and Cold War II are very different, there may be some lessons from Cold War I that we need to learn in order to prevent this increasingly hostile relationship from you know, sparking uh, an actual uh, military conflict. So oh, I, how depressing. On, on that very um, positive note, I want to thank you for the great talk. Okay. <laughs>